Sir John Whittingdale. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. And can I begin by congratulating my honourable friend, the Member for Harwich, on securing this debate for a second time. And perhaps if we look back on what was said a year ago, there was some foresight that if greater attention had been paid at that time, we might not be in such a bad state today. Mm. But I do want to differ slightly with the honourable member who spoke o o earlier uh, for Tiverton when he said that it wasn't just Putin, it was the whole of the Russian people. Um, I don't think we should demonise the Russian people. As my honourable friend has just said in his very good speech, um, the Russian people have suffered terribly under the Tsars, under the Bolsheviks, under the Nazi invasion, under communism, and now under Putin. They have never known democracy yeah. and freedom, and that is the tragedy that they now face. And Putin is well a final successor along that long line. And the warning signs were there early on. Putin was originally thought to be a sort of manager who would somehow <coughs> restore stability after the rather chaotic Yeltsin times, and he wouldn't interfere too much with the oligarchs. That didn't last long. We know he called the oligarchs in and made it very clear to them who was now in charge. Mm. We first saw the signs back in 2006 with the murder on British soil of Alexander Litvinenko. And if anybody wants reminding of that, there's a very good ITV dram dramatization with David Tennant available now. We saw it again with the war in Georgia in 2008, where the West stood by and really did very little. Uh, and then um, an exceptionally good documentary by Norma Percy, who was a superb uh, documentary, documentary uh, maker, is about to be screened on the BBC called Putin and the West. I was able to see a preview of the first episode, and I strongly recommend it. And she identified the Eastern Partnership Summit uh, in 2013, when Yanukovych went to Vilnius to sign the agreement which would eventually lead to the possible membership of the European Union by uh, Ukraine. And just before he signed, he got a call. And the call came from the Kremlin. And as a result, he was told he was not allowed to sign, and indeed did not. That sparked what became known as the Revolution of Dignity on the Maidan. It led to the 100 people being shot down by the snipers from the hotel roofs. Um, and of course, shortly after that, Putin took advantage and Crimea was invaded. We again did not do nearly enough. Indeed, Barack Obama, president at the time, when asked about the invasion of Crimea, condemned it, but he said Russia is a regional power that is threatening some of its immediate neighbours. And he went on to say Russian actions are a problem, but they don't pose the number one security threat to the United States. Well, if ever there was an invitation for Putin to carry on, that was it. Mm. And actually, we know, and, and this comes out of the documentary, that the description of Russia as a regional power infuriated Putin because what he wanted was to restore what the Soviet Union had been, the mm. second major player uh, in global power. And that has always been part of his strategy. The Honourable Gentleman opposite asked if, if these matters had been debated. Um, I had a debate in 2014 just after the Crimean invasion, drawing attention to the threat. You, Mr Deputy Speaker, actually participated and made some very helpful remarks in that course of that debate. And, of course, that led on to the British government's Operation Orbital, in which we did supply training and munitions to the Ukrainian forces. And I think it is fair to say that had we not done that, the Ukrainians would not have been able to resist the Russian invasion as effectively as they have, and they recognise that, and it, they are very open in paying tribute to this country for the support that we gave them and continue to give them, of course, in Operation Orbital. Uh, and that then led to um, the election in 2019 of uh, President Zelensky, and I went and was an election observer uh, in both rounds of that. And it was the enthusiasm of the people of Ukraine for the democratic process, for their ability to change their leader, which they did, and bring in somebody committed to wiping out corruption. That really frightened Putin, too, because he could see that if that could happen in Ukraine, then potentially it could happen in Russia as well. 
And so the narrative was created that somehow Ukraine was a bogus, illegitimate regime run by Nazis and that the Ukrainian people were all oppressed and that they would all cheer when the Russians came to liberate them. Never has a more ludicrous justification been given. And this, what the scenes that we see of the resistance by the Ukrainian, not just the armed forces, but the whole Ukrainian people to the Russian invasion. Kherson was one of the four provinces we were told had voted in this referendum overwhelmingly that they wanted to join the Russian Federation. And then we saw the scenes of jubilation on the streets of Kherson when they were liberated by the Ukrainian forces not that long ago. Mm. The truth is that Russia is an authoritarian regime, and I don't just want to talk about Ukraine. We need to help free the Russian people themselves. And I have the privilege of meeting, as I've met before uh, this week, Evgenia Karamurza, who is married to Vladimir Karamurza, who is being held as a political prisoner in Russia. Yeah. We're told that there are something like 500 political prisoners in Russia. Uh, Mr. Karamurza is slightly different in that he is a British passport holder. And I was disappointed to hear from his wife uh, that she felt the British government could be doing more to campaign uh, and help him to obtain his release. But the other area which I have long followed, as uh, you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, know and others do, uh, is in media freedom. And I just say that this is the conclusion of Reporters Without Borders about Russia that has now fallen even further on their index to 155 out of 180 countries in terms of media freedom. They have said, since Russia invaded Ukraine in February 2022, almost all independent media have been banned, blocked, or declared foreign agents. All others are subject to military censorship. All privately owned independent TV channels are banned from broadcasting. The Russian version of Euronews was suspended. And among the big, big print media outlets, those that have preserved their independence and were under constant threat of closure, like Novaya Gazeta, have had to suspend their publication. Media freedom does not exist in Russia. And one particular case very recently, the Russian journalist Ivan Safronov, who, who reported information that was already available to anybody to see online has just received a sentence of 22 years imprisonment for revealing so-called state secrets. One day, I hope that Russia too will be free. And I just want to conclude by referring to some remarks that the Honourable Gentleman for Rhonda made. I have been uh, looking for the OSCE Parliamentary Assembly, and unlike my honourable friend for Henley, who was very successful in having Russia removed from the Council of Europe, unfortunately Russia remain members of the OSCE Parliamentary Assembly. But we have been looking at the possibility of prosecution for war crimes. It will be unprecedented in that previous war crimes cases have always been brought against the perpetrators who were parts of regimes that have been de defeated and removed. And whilst I would love to think that Mr Putin will be defeated and removed, it seems unlikely in the immediate future. Mm -hmm. So it may be that we will have to prosecute in absentia, but that is not a reason not to do so. There may even need to be a special tribunal created to do that. But the second part of it, and, and, and I just, there are four potential crimes here, and Russia is probably guilty of all of them. Crimes against humanity, war crimes, genocide, and on genocide, as my old friend my right friend said earlier, we should have recognised Russia's earlier attempt at genocide in Ukraine, the Holodomor, and actually that showed that there has been a long-standing wish to suppress Ukrainian identity, and that could conceivably be called genocide. Uh, but the fourth uh, charge will be the war of aggression, against which it may be possible to uh, require reparations to be, to be paid. And I, I just want to finish by very much supporting the suggestion of the Honourable Gentleman for Rhonda that there are vast Russian assets uh, in this country and elsewhere in the West. And it must be right that we now look, as Canada is doing, as Estonia is doing, at potentially using those assets to rebuild Ukraine, which already appears uh, to be a bill that may well be approaching uh, $1 trillion. But it has to be the case 
that Russia is not just held to account for its crimes, but is made to pay for the reconstruction of Ukraine. Yeah. Yeah. Philip Dunn. Uh, thank you very much, and it's a great pleasure to follow my right.